Hi there. So uh, yeah, I study uh, pain. I thought I'd start off by uh, telling you why it's the uh, most important thing you could possibly study. Um, the first thing is it's simply the most prevalent human health problem. It's the number one reason why people go to seek uh, uh, health care uh, in the first place, uh, by quite a margin, in fact. Um, if you do surveys of people with diseases that are going to kill them or make them completely disabled and you ask them what they're worried about, you would imagine they would say, I'm worried about dying or not being able to move my hands. That's not what they say. They say, I'm worried about pain, whether my pain will be controlled. And then finally, despite what generations of medical doctors have learned in school, continue to be learned in school, don't worry about pain, cure the disease, the pain will take care of itself. This is wrong. Pain is separate from disease, and pain can kill you, in fact. The latest evidence out of uh, the UK is that uh, chronic pain takes uh, five to seven years off your life. Um, one thing that makes pain hard to treat and hard to study is the variability that's encountered here. So here's an example uh, of a study where 500 people had exactly the same thermal stimulus uh, given to their forearm and asked to rate it from no pain at all to worst pain I can imagine. And you can see that there was uh, ratings starting from about 5 to 95, exactly the same stimulus. This needs to be explained, and if we could explain it, we'd uh, uh, do better at treating people with pain. Of course, this sort of trait variability always comes down to nature versus nurture and their interaction, right? There are genes to find, there are environmental factors, and there's the interaction between the two. And that's what we do. We try to uh, identify all the genetic and non-genetic factors we can, leading to variability in pain. And over the years, we've come up with a whole bunch of pain genes, which I've listed. We've come up with a whole lot of environmental factors, a lot of which are uh, social in nature. Uh, we've come up with sex differences within these factors, uh, and uh, recently we've spent a lot of time uh, working on new pain tests, new ways of measuring pain uh, in the mouse. So I want to just give you one example of something we're working on now that's pretty funny. Um, so uh, you're looking at pain in a mouse. I did something nasty to it. Don't worry about that. It's not important. And that's the, that's the amount of pain it has at baseline. Okay. Here's what happens to that pain simply when there are people from my laboratory in the room while the mouse is in pain. And you can see four different people, they all produce pain inhibition, they all produce analgesia. Now, that's probably explainable. They probably think we're a predator to them. So this is predator-induced analgesia. This is actually a known phenomenon. Here's the funny part. Only the men, not the women. <laughs> the women in my laboratory stand in the room, absolutely nothing happens. And by the way, it doesn't need to be men and women. It can be the t-shirts that the men or the women slept in the night before produces exactly the same effect. Also leading us to believe this is a, a testosterone effect is the fact that my 11-year-old son produces a partial effect. <laughs> and a 69-year-old man in our department who shall remain nameless also produces a partial effect. <laughs> Thanks a lot.